So hi there, my name is Nathan Holland. I am a uh, developer, protocol engineer at a company called O1 Labs, working on the Coda cryptocurrency protocol. And today I'm going to talk to you about uh, GADTs and how we can use them to write safer code. So first off, what is a GADT? Well, a GADT is a generalized algebraic data type. And uh, what GADTs do is they provide a way for us to reason about um, types on a per-constructor basis. Um, so if you don't know what this means, we're going to build our way up there. But this is a definition of really what a GADT is. Um, and GADTs are available for use in modern, strongly typed functional programming languages such as Haskell and OCaml. Although for the, uh, this particular talk, I will be focusing on OCaml. Um, so what can we do with GADTs? Well, first off, GADTs can allow us to add invariants to our, type uh, to our uh, data structures at a type level so that we can't construct a value of that type that doesn't satisfy those invariants. Um, it also allows us to restrict values of a type that can be passed into our functions. Um, we can also encode simple logic into the type system using GADTs. And we can enable certain runtime representation optimizations with GADTs by removing the necessity for having dynamic type information at runtime and having to check different types. For the purposes of this talk, though, we're going to be focusing on the first two points. So how can we add invariance to data structures with GADTs? And how can we limit the values we pass into our functions with GADTs? So first off, just a show of hands, who here knows OCaml or has worked with OCaml? OK, yeah, that's kind of what I expected. <laughs> so I'm just going to do a short overview of some OCaml syntax and some types in OCaml, um, just so people are on the same page. But anybody who's worked with Haskell, um, OCaml, for the purposes of this talk, is fairly similar to Haskell, at least the scope that we're going to talk about. Um, so in OCaml, we have you know, our pretty standard types we'd expect, like int and float and string. And we can define custom types like this. So a string and an int is a tuple of a string and an int. You'll notice that unlike Haskell, tuples are not comma separated. They're separated by this little asterisk operator. So just keep that in mind. Um, we can also define uh, function types very similar to Haskell. So this is really exactly the same. And here's just some examples of what function definition syntax can look like. These are all equivalent statements for defining some value add in the language. Um, the only one that's really important to know here, though, is this first one, which is very verbose. This is an explicit type annotation of the function type and then an assignment to an anonymous function. We're going to see this form a lot today in the presentation. So um, just be familiar with this form. So we basically have the value and then a colon and the type. And then over here, we define some function that's going to be you know, assigned into that value. Um, we also have parametric polymorphism, just like Haskell. Um, so types can have parameters, and we can use those parameters to um, have polymorphic types. And so here's an example of uh, you know, a list type. You'll notice that unlike Haskell, the type parameters are backwards. So we'd say the type parameter before the name of the type. Um, and we use this tick, this is the asterisk, to represent the actual type parameters themselves. Um, and so here's just an example of a function that reduces a pair, just a tuple of two of the same type. Um, and we also have universal quantification. Um, and this is something we're going to see sometimes when we work with ADTs. And essentially, the way you can read this is this is a type signature um, where for any A, any type A, this function can take in a list of some type A and return an integer. And we're going to see this a lot with GADTs. No, because um, when you do this universal quantification, you just don't use ticks. I don't know why. It's weird OCaml syntax thing. There is a way to do universal quantification with the ticks. I don't know why there's two options. So this is essentially the same as a for all type in Haskell. So if you're familiar with Haskell, just replace this type name with for all, and it's the same. So let's start off by doing a quick review of ADTs. Um, for the purposes of this talk, we're going to be talking about variant ADTs, because that is the type of ADT that we use to, uh, or that's the type of ADT that we can actually generalize over. So a variant ADT is essentially a sum type, where each of the constructors of the sum type can contain some kind of product type. Um, so Really what that means is that in this example, we have some type example with three different constructors. And you can see how some of these, we actually can give arguments to the constructors. So A is just a constructor by itself. It doesn't encapsulate a value. B encapsulates an integer. C encapsulates a string and a float. And here's just an example of how we can define an example using a constructor. We can also have um, recursive ADTs. So here's an example of how list is defined at OCaml. Um, you'll notice that there's the special syntax, special constructors we can use for overriding the list syntax in OCaml, which is the empty list and then the constructor operator for a list. And so really, this is 
just the definition of a list. And whenever you define ADT that uses these two symbols, whenever you use list syntax in that scope, it's actually going to be talking about this ADT. So we have our base case of an empty list, and then we have our inductive case where we're constructing a cell of the list where we have some head and some tail. And so since this is parameterized over A, if we call this an int list, then it will be a list of integers. Every value in there will be an integer. And just one last quick example. Here's how you could define a binary tree using this same system. So here's some binary tree. We have values of the leaves. We have branches that have two children and some value in them. And here's an example of how we can construct a binary tree, and that's, that's what it would look like. OK? So ADTs are great. But since every constructor of an ADT has the same type, it uh, makes a limitation that we aren't able to reason about the types that are encapsulated inside of an ADT, except through that one type parameter, in which case that type parameter has to be the same in all constructive cases. Um, and it may not be immediately obvious what the disadvantage of this is, but let's take a look at an example where we define an ADT that is not type safe. So let's say we want to define an expression tree for some language, just a really simple DSL or something that operates on integers and booleans. And so we have some value that will represent whether or not it's an integer or a boolean. And then we'll have our actual expression tree. And we have some operations here that operate on booleans, like negation and and. We have operations that op operate on integers, like add. And we have an equality operation that will compare two values. The issue with this is that while it's very easy to construct values, like 2 plus 3 here, we can also construct incorrect values. So this expression, 5 and true, has an incorrect type. Because um, what does it mean to you know, take the conjunction of an integer and a Boolean? So when we implement an evaluator that evaluates this expression tree format, we're going to have to actually do type checking at runtime about what the type constructor we got back was from evaluating some nested expression. And then we'll have to raise an exception. And so this is not ideal. We can't actually do the same kind of checks we can do at compile time with our other types. If, however, we had used a GADT to define this, what we'd be able to do is we'd be able to talk about the type that is returned by the expression. And so if we just have a value 5, for instance, this is going to be an int expression because it's going to return an integer. Similarly, if we do an equality between 5 and 3, it's a Boolean because we get back a Boolean. And furthermore, um, this equality operator won't work if you try and pass in like a bool and an integer or something, because it expects two values of the same type passed into it. And so, for example, if we try and construct one of the expressions we tried to construct before, like 2 plus 5 equals 3, um, we're going to get a type error here at compile time. So we don't actually, in our evaluator, have to handle the different edge cases where we might get types that are incompatible and have to raise exceptions. So now that we have a basic understanding of what GADTs are and what we, they give us, let's go over some really basic constructions of GADTs. We're going to start out really simple. Um, we're going to go over some really basic GADT constructions. And they may not seem immediately useful, but we will use them eventually. So just stick with me for the first couple definitions. I just want to kind of go over some simple um, syntax and kind of explain how that works. So a really common type of GADT is a type witness. Um, and essentially, all a type witness is, is it's a GADT that creates some kind of mapping in between its type parameters and its constructors. Okay? So in this case, we have an int constructor and a float constructor. And the int constructor has type int witness, and the float constructor has type float witness. And so what OCaml knows about this type now is that the only two values that are allowable in this parameter are either int or float. Any other parameter we try to put there will get a compile time error. Furthermore, if we talk about some, one of these two constructors as a value, we can actually then talk about this parameter. And so we can pass around these constructors to then basically reflect type parameters back into the type system. That's kind of a way to think about it. Um, we can also have recursive GADTs, just like we have recursive ADTs. So here's an example of a recursive type witness. So if we wanted to add like a list type, a list type also has its own type parameter. So a list type takes an argument when we talk about it as a type. Similarly, if we make a list witness constructor, our list witness constructor will take in some other witness of type A, and this type that we're constructing will be a, a list of that type. Does that make sense? Um, so a really common pattern that we use when we talk about GDTs is to talk about numbers as types. 
And in order to talk about numbers as type, you have to have some kind of inductive definition of numbers. A really uh, easy inductive definition of, of natural numbers is piano numbers, which basically goes like this. Um, your base case of a piano number is zero, and any other piano number is a successor of some other piano number. And so using this, you can inductively define you know, all of the natural numbers infinitely. And so as an example, zero is just zero, one is the successor of zero, four is the successor of the successor of the successor of the successor of zero. It keeps on going on and on. What's nice about this is because it's inductive in this way, we can define it also at a type level. So here, we can represent zero as a unit, and we can represent um, the successor type as some function that takes a unit and returns the number that we are one more than. So essentially, the arity of the function becomes our number. It becomes our natural number. So for instance, one is the successor of zero, which you know, expands out to a function that takes a unit and returns a unit. Two is the successor of one, which expands out to a function that takes a unit and returns a function that takes a unit and returns a unit. And you just keep on kind of nesting these like this. So you're treating the arrow function you know, type, op, you know, type operator as a way to store information. And similar to what we did with the type witness, we can create uh, um, a mapping between some GADT constructor and that type level number that we're talking about. So here, we have the same kind of constructor we had before when we defined piano numbers as an ADT, but now we're actually able to reflect the information back up into the type parameter of what this number is. So we have this number that we can represent both as a value and as a type. And so these are just some examples of how you can define some GADT numbers. And you'll notice that like the GADT number one is the type two piano. So when you talk about a piano type, you can get this type parameter out to refer to the, the, type, value the, the type value associated with the constructed value of our GADT. So a great application of using these kind of typo of piano numbers is to find a type called a vector, or a vect for short. Um, what a vector is, is a vector is a list that has a, um, the length of the list is encoded as a type parameter. So um, before we had like a tick A list, and this is some list of type A. Here we have a vector which takes in two type parameters, n and a. a is the type of the elements in the list, and n is a piano, type level piano number that represents the length of that list. So you'll notice that the definition here for talking about that parameter n is essentially the same as what we had before in our GDT, where we have zero, and then we talk about some piano number n, and that is a type in the successor of n. Similarly, when we define our list, the base case, the empty list, is zero, because there's no elements in there. And when we construct a new element on top of that list, we have a head and a tail of length n, and that means that what we're constructing is a vector uh, of length n plus one, or the successor of n. Another really useful um, way that you can use a very, this similar technique is to actually store individual types at each of those. Um, so like before we had like these functions representing uh, numbers at a type level that were all the types were unit. But now we can actually put individual types in each of those um, you know, arguments of our function that we're building up. And so this allows us to find a type level list where we have a list of types that we talk about. And so a type level list, the base case, an empty list is just unit. And whenever we have an element in the list for you know, constructing something on the head, we just have a type a function that takes the head and returns the tail. And so this allows us to use that same piano number pattern that we had before. Whoops. Right, it's very similar, except that we have this extra parameter that allows us to inject specific types into there instead of just everything being unit. And a good use case of this is to define a heterogeneous list. Um, usually in statically typed functional programming, we're used to working with homogeneous lists, which is to say that every element of the list will have the same type. If we have an int list, every element in that list is type int. In this case, a heterogeneous list allows us to actually represent lists where every element of the list is a different type. And the way we can do that is by talking about some type parameter of the H list, which is a list of types. It's a type level list, just like what we constructed before. And so as an example, we can define some value x, which is an H list, of an int, a string, and some function. And here is what that looks like, represented as a type parameter to H list. So now that we have exposed some, some basic type parameters with our GDTs, we can actually start to use these to restrict what values are allowed to be passed into our functions. Um, 
And so here, I'm just kind of calling these value safe functions, which just refers to the fact that at compile time, we are restricting exactly what values we're supposed to be passed in. You have to show to the compiler that the value that you're passing in matches the type, like has the restrictions that the type expresses. So one simple example of this, and this is a little weird to think about at first, but I'm going to walk through it, is to um, define a function like, let's say we want to define a function like take five, that will take in some list and return the first five elements from it. Normally, if we define this without a GDT, we would have to throw an error or return like none if we didn't have five elements in the list. But we, what we can actually do here is we can define a function that enforces at compile time that the list passed in has to have at least five elements in it. And the way we do that's a little backwards, but we basically define some type construct, well, some type that is five more than some other type. That's what plus five is here. So given some type as a piano number of, of n, we just return that n plus five, okay? And then what we can do is we can say our function takes in a vector that is n plus five in length and returns a vector of five. So that basically, what this means at a type level is that whatever piano number we pass in here has to have at least five successors. You know, that's basically what this means. And so when we pattern match on our, uh, on our value, we only have to actually give one case that deconstructs it. We just take the five elements here and we return a vector of those five elements. In this last case here, we're able to pattern match every other case and give a dot, which is essentially OCaml's form of a case reputation. It's saying, there is no other reachable case. I have matched all cases. Please check that. And so if OCaml didn't believe that there was any, that there was, if OCaml believed there were still reachable states, it would throw a uh, error at compile time. But if OCaml believed you when you said that this case can't be reached, it will be like, okay, fine. You don't have to handle that because it's unreachable code. Just one more example. I'm not going to go through this quite as much, but here's an example of how we can define an uninitialized reduction function. Oftentimes when we're reducing lists, um, we're using fold. And when you do fold, you have to give an initial parameter. Why do you have to give an initial parameter? Because what does it mean to fold over an empty list? What value do you return? If you have an empty list, you have no value in there of type A. So you always have to give some initial element. But if you knew that a list had at least one element in it, you could actually define reduction that didn't require initial element, and you could just reduce over the elements in there. And that's what this does. We say that we're taking in some function that operates on our type A, and we're taking in a vector that is at least one in length. And then when we pattern match on that vector initially, to get our initial element, we can just take out the head from that and ignore all the other cases, because there's no other case. It has to have at least one element. So let's go over another way that we can use GDTs to add invariants to our data structures so that we can't construct values that don't you know, follow those invariants. Um, and a fun example, I think, of this is how you can build a balanced binary tree using GDT. This is a type that expresses as an invariant uh, in our GDT parameter that the binary tree we construct must be balanced. And the way it does that is a little interesting. The way we do it is we actually encode the depth of a binary tree so when we have a leaf, the depth of a binary tree is zero. Um, and when we have a branch, it has two children of equal depth. And the one we're constructing has one more than that depth. And since we have used the same parameter here, that means that since the two children have equal depth, that the tree, no matter how it's constructed, will always be balanced. Um, and here's just an example of a way that you can talk about this in a function. Here's some function split that just basically takes in a balanced binary tree and returns its two children. And this is the same kind of pattern we saw before, where we're saying that the binary tree we're taking in has to have at least depth one. You know, if it has depth one, it has children. And then we can ignore all the other cases because there is, it can't be a leaf. A leaf is a zero, and OCaml knows that since this is at least one, it can never be a leaf. <clears throat> so let's move on to a more practical example that is a little easier to see how this can actually be useful in your everyday you know, coding. And so the problem and solution I'm going to review today is actually a, a problem and solution that uh, is involved in my work at Coda, working on a cryptocurrency. And it's something that exists in our code today and makes our code safer. So just a sh very short intro on what a blockchain is, if you don't know. You don't have to know much about blockchain for this problem. A blockchain is basically a decentralized link list. So you have like, er, decentralized reverse linked list where every node just points back to some predecessor in the linked list. And people on the network will have maybe, you know, some of these nodes while other people won't. So you're basically constantly gossiping 
these blocks around on the network. And people are trying to request blocks from other people. People are adding new blocks to the blockchain and telling people they added a block. And there's all sorts of stuff going on. And so blocks can be received in a variety of ways in multiple code paths. And in different code paths, we may uh, have to handle validation differently. Meaning that, for instance, let's say we got new blocks gossip over the network versus we were missing blocks and we request it from up here. Um, we might actually have to do validation on that block in a different order. And furthermore, different functions in the system will require that we've done certain levels of validation already. We don't want to add a block to our blockchain until we to know it's totally valid. Or we may not want to do some expensive computation to validate a block until we've done some cheaper computation that can validate some really simple state of a block beforehand. So perhaps a naive solution to this would be to uh, analyze all of the possible traversals of validation states that you can get down all of your code paths and generate a finite state machine that uh, basically goes to all of the possible permutations of validation you can reach. And then you could take all of those nodes in your finite state machine and you could turn them into abstract but concretely equivalent types so the types are not compatible with each other and then build validation functions that will you know, take in some type of some level of validation and return some type of some other level of validation. But then because they're all unique types, we have to define all this boilerplate code over and over again. And we have to populate a whole bunch of restricted functions with the correct type. And the problem with that is that if a function requires one level of validation, but doesn't require another, and we've already over-validated that type, we're going to have to define a whole bunch of identity functions that are going to map down and forget validation. And so this isn't scalable. As our problem gets more complex, as we have new ways to traverse through the validation states, th this doesn't scale very well and it's very messy. So a better solution would be to use a GADT and expose each validation uh, state as an individual type parameter that we can talk about. Then we can implement single function for each validation computation. And then we can use universal quantification in our functions that require certain levels of validation to say that certain states of validation are not required. So the way we can do this is we can define a type level Boolean. And the way we do this is we define two phantom types. Um, a phantom type, for those who don't know, is a type that has no inhabitants. So it's unique. You can talk about it as a type. The type checker will not see the two, two different phantom types as compatible, but you can't actually construct the value of that type. So it's only for talking about in the type level. And then we can create a GADT witness that maps between some value constructors for these Booleans back into that type level Boolean. Then we can define our block, doesn't matter what the block is, and we can decorate our block with some validation state. Here we're just going to start with one validation state, but then we'll expand it to multiple validation states in the next example. And so here we have some block with validation, and that is a tuple of a block and some uh, type level, or some uh, Boolean witness that gives us our type level Boolean. Um, and then that is going to be some block with validation with that type level Boolean. So when we talk about, for instance, a false block with validation, that means the block has not been validated. If we talk, a true, talk about a true block with validation, that means it has been. And so here's some example interfaces we can define with that. Um, we can say that to validate a block, we have not done validation already because we don't want to do validation twice. It might be expensive. So the block we pass in must be false. It must not have been validated. And we return one that has been validated. We can say that in order to accept the block into our blockchain, um, the block has to have been validated so that we can't pass in something we didn't already validate. And then we can also say that certain operations on blocks don't require validation. So here we're saying for all type valid, um, the block can have any validation state. So it can either be true or false. doesn't matter when we pass into this function. So let's expand this to um, show how we can do this with multiple validation states. And when we get multiple validation states, we want to use a technique to kind of name our parameters. Because we might have like six or eight different validation states that we have to do. And that can get really messy. If you have six or eight type parameters, you have to remember the order and you have to make sure you get them right every single time. So we're going to use a little trick here in order to provide a name to our type parameters. And this is a little weird, but basically OCaml has this concept of a anonymous uh, ADT variant. And so what we're doing here is we're saying that there, so anonymous ADT variant is a way to talk about ADT constructors without defining them prior. So what we say here is that um, a time validation is a tuple 
of some ADT type that only has one constructor time. This is just a way that we can inject a name into the type system, basically, paired with the validation state. And the same thing for transactions. And the reason why this is useful is because when we, when we talk about these type parameters, we have to explicitly name all of these. So if we had six type parameters and we messed up which one goes in the right place, we would get a type error at compile time. Um, and that just keeps our code sane so that we don't accidentally mix up like, oh, the fourth one was time validation. I thought it was something else. <clears throat> and so here's an example of what a function would look like that would validate time. Since we don't actually care about the validation state of transactions, we introduce a universal quantification over the transactions validation and just require that time validation is false. And we return the transactions validation with the same state that we started at. So we're not, if, it, if transaction validation was false to begin with, it'll still be false at the end. If it was true to begin with, it'll still be true at the end. And then we're just basically setting the time validation here. And just a couple more examples. Here's our same block parent, you know, get uh, block parent hash function, which doesn't care about either of the validation states. And we can also use uh, other GADTs to encapsulate some details about validation levels. If, for instance, we are constantly talking about a certain level of validation, maybe it might be more useful to just alias it, you know? So that's just a way that like, we can say that, you know, this, a, a block that is at least time validated can be any state of transaction validation with at least true validation on time. Um, so now we've come full circle. Let's revisit the original prompt that I gave at the beginning about how we can use uh, GADTs to encode type safe expression trees and show how we can actually construct that GADT that I showed us using at the beginning to ensure that we can't construct an incorrect tree. So before we had two different constructors that encapsulated our two different values in, in bool. In this case, we're gonna do things a little differently. We're gonna use a type witness to represent the types of int and bool, okay? And then what we can do oops, is we can then take this and we can use this to define a limited polymorphic equality function. And so this is an example of how we can use a type witness to actually you know, be useful. But, um, so here we have an equal function that takes in some type witness of type T. And then if you give a type witness of type T, you need to give two values of that type T to it. And then it will compare those two values. And what's nice about this is that unlike if we had implemented equality on our previous ADT construction of ints and bulls, the only case we need to match is actually the case for the type witness. Because if int was passed in here, that means that this and this are an integer. If bool was passed in here, that means that this and this are a bool. And once we get inside of the uh, pattern matching statement, OCaml will be aware in this scope x and y are booleans. And then we can just do equality on them. And you'll notice that we don't have to do case reputation here because we did exhaustively match all of our type witness cases. So here's how we can define the actual GADT for that expression tree. Um, you'll notice here the value is some type witness paired with a value of that type associated with the type witness. Um, we can give explicit types to our um, Boolean expression saying that they can, you know, if you're gonna negate something, that thing you're negating should be a Boolean expression. If you're going to conjunct two things, those should both be Boolean expressions. Similarly, equality can say that it doesn't care whether or not these expressions are ints or bools, but they need to be the same type. We don't want to do comparisons on types that are different. And integer, sorry, add is just operating on integers. And so this is how we can define an evaluation function for an expression tree. And what I want to point out here is that you'll notice that this is actually a rather simple definition of an evalu like an evaluation function for an expression tree, because if we had done it with an ADT, we would constantly have to check the types that we're getting back. Every time we evaluate something, we're getting back an int or a Boolean. But here, because it's the, the rules for the types and the children are encoded here, we don't have to check any of that because it's being checked for us at compile time. So all we have to do is just recursively call our evaluation function and pull out the value from there. So the evaluation function returns a type witness and a value of that type. And so sometimes we might be actually want the type witness there so that we can prove that you know, x prime is some type t. But in other cases, we just need to get the value of some other underlying expression. So as an example, let's run through um, the not case. Uh, when we do uh, negation, that means that the type we're returning must be a Boolean. 
So we're just putting a bool there. And then we're going to, uh, we have our expression x, which is the Boolean expression we want to negate. We're going to evaluate x and then pull the value out of there. Notice that we don't have to type check that value because we know it's a Boolean. And then we just call not on it, which is the negation function. As a second example, equality is a little different. In equality, what we do is we first evaluate x and we extract both the type witness and the value from there. And then we evaluate y. And when we evaluate y, we don't need a type witness anymore because y we know is the same type as x. So we only need one type witness. And then what we can do is we can call our limited polymorphic equality function on the type witness that we got from x with both x and y that we evaluated. And since it's the same type, everything's going to work out. <coughs> so there are some limitations to GADTs that are important to know if you're going to work with them. Um, oftentimes, using GADTs can limit your ability to do tail recursion. So for instance, in our last example, because we aren't just returning one value, we're not able to actually do a tail recursive call. We should be able to do a tail recursive call here, but we can't. Because we have to you know, first extract that value from what we call. Um, so that's one problem. Another problem is that while certain GADT techniques can be used to actually hide runtime, like remove runtime information by talking about types ahead of time, other GADT constructions, like that validation state that I talked about, actually introduces new memory allocations. So there's extra information that we wouldn't ordinarily need, but we need in order to have type safety. And <clears throat> there's also, if you compare GADTs to like, you know, proper dependent typing, it's very limited in what you can really do with it. Um, but the nice thing about GDTs and the reason why you want to use them is because they're available today in Haskell and OCaml. So if you're using Haskell or OCaml at work, this is something you can start adding to your code base today and start getting some safety out of your code. So in conclusion, uh, GDTs are extremely useful for certain things, but knowing how and when to use them effectively can be a little tricky. My recommendation would be, if you're interested in using GDTs, just go and start playing with them. Because it's kind of a thing where you can only really learn the limitations by doing it yourself. And the limitations of what you can and can't do with them will be slightly different across different languages because they have slightly different type systems. All right, any questions? That's usually a bad sign. <laughs> <laughs> do you know how these affect like, compiler performance? Like, If you encode big logic tables, yes. For most small cases, no. Um, I, don't, I don't know overall. Uh, the big thing that can affect performance is actually when you have really deeply nested lists of index witnesses. That's one thing I know causes very bad performance in uh, OCaml. Uh, there's actually some tricks you can do to improve that performance. But essentially, once you make your list too long and you have too many type indices, the, the compiler just starts taking exponential time and it takes forever. Um, but most JDT constructions I have used uh, work fine and don't seem to affect compile time significantly at all. What about the runtime representation? So you already said there was um, an issue in not being able to do tail recursion. And with that version there, you're carrying a random type witness, which I think is actually taking up storage of runtime. It is, yeah. Um, is it possible to use phantom types or something like that? Because that seems to be the way it would be done in Haskell, so phantom types. The compiler knows that it compiles and it doesn't need to have it at runtime. Yes, you actually could use phantom types to completely remove that information. I gave the example of using just a type witness that's uh, represented by a value constructor, um, just because it's simpler. But what you can do is you can use phantom types and then define some type that maps between those phantom types. So you define a GDT that takes two parameters. Um, one is the, the phantom type, and the other one is the actual like OCaml level type. And then that doesn't have to actually be represented at value level. Um, you can just talk about that abstractly. And then you could remove all the type information at runtime. OK. So it would have just complicated this example, but it is possible. Yes, it's possible. Yeah, I just chose not to for this presentation. Makes sense. Anything else? All right, well, I guess I ended early. <laughs>